Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a moment to tell you about our sponsor, the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. While government and industry focus on the latest cyber threats, we still need more institutions and individuals who take a longer view. They're the people who are helping to create the norms and policies that will keep us all safe in cyberspace. The Cyber Initiative supports a cyber policy field that offers thoughtful solutions to complex challenges for the benefit of societies around the world. Learn more at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. So one of the offerings that RBS, or Risk-Based Security, does is data breach tracking. That's Brian Martin. He's the VP of Vulnerability Intelligence at Risk-Based Security. The research we're discussing today is titled, You Didn't Think the Sony Saga Was Over, Did You? As it sounds, you basically look for any data breach where there was a, a loss of information from a company, and it doesn't matter to us whether it was an outside hack, an insider, lost to media, we track it all. And we basically aggregate that information, wrap metadata around it, and then do a wide variety of analytics. So the customers that use that data can basically look at what it's like in their industry, are there increased attacks against people in the same verticals, etc. So when we were looking at the Sony breach, we were looking at some of the interesting facets, like obviously the attribution, who did it, Then a lot of security companies started chiming in saying it was North Korea, others said China, some said internal employees. There was a wide variety of suspects and ideas behind it. Because of the breach, what it impacted, by that I mean the internal emails and media leaks, movies, you name it. I mean, Sony basically just got ransacked. But the internal emails alone made it a lot more interesting for people because you got a good glimpse at how Sony operated kind of day to day at the executive level. Mm. And some of it was not easy to read. It was kind of messy. There were some emails that were considered largely racist. There was a wide variety of emails regarding actors and prices that they got paid And there was disparity between male and female actors. So yeah, there were a lot of different nuances to this breach that went way beyond the technical, beyond, okay, who hacked them? And it really became a huge social issue. So with all of that coming down uh, day by day, we started to kind of track it and do a roundup of the news and kind of our commentary on it. And we ended up doing, I think it was 23 updates between November 24th 2014 and February 22nd. So over two months, we did a lot of commentary. And then in 2016, we kind of did a looking back a year after the hack and after everything had died down. And then uh, more recently, last month, news broke that the U.S. had identified one of the actors behind the attack, and it was a North Korean government operative. So once the bad actor was identified, it was interesting to us to go back to the original stories to see which security companies had predicted which bad actors were involved. Mm -hmm. And we kind of re-examined that to see how many of them had said North Korea, how many had said China, how many said internal, and kind of point out, well, this is once again the hard part about attribution for any kind of computer attack. 
Yeah, and it, I mean, I, I remember back in 2014, there was this notion of this group called the Guardians of Peace, and then uh, it flipped all over the place. Like you mentioned earlier, it was uh, there was speculation that it was uh, all internal, that there weren't any foreign actors at all. Then over time, it seems like we landed on this group, uh, the Lazarus Group. Can you describe to us how did we get to that point and, and what do we know about them? So the buildup, obviously some people suspected that North Korea was involved originally. The fact that North Korea was actually in the press making statements at one point saying maybe it was us, maybe it wasn't, and then later denying it. There was clearly some evidence that pointed that direction, technical evidence, and it was found by both private companies and U.S. law enforcement. So between that and the notion that it could have been, over the past roughly two years, what is known as the Lazarus Group has been active in several other campaigns. And we created a quick timeline of the lead up between February 2016 and August 2018. So right before the North Korean was positively identified. And it shows the Lazarus Group not only engaging in a wide variety of campaigns, but a lot of them were based on stealing money, whether it was Bitcoin or the Bangladesh Central Bank heist. They are believed to be behind a wide variety of ransomware, including WannaCry. There are other pointers that suggested, wait a minute, this group is part of this campaign. And now we're seeing even more indications that that campaign had some of the same technical footprints that were related to Sony. And so basically, kind of behind the scenes, even though a lot of this was public in one-off articles, I imagine behind the scenes, the FBI and any other law enforcement agency investigating were compiling this evidence. And it was basically just slowly building up and painting this picture that one way or another, North Korea was involved. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think one of the aspects is that Generally, when we think of North Korea, they, they're they after money. They're looking to fund their operations. And the Sony hack, as you say, there was a lot of intrigue there, perhaps not so much on the financial side. Yeah, when the Sony breach happened and the, the fallout shortly after, there was a lot of speculation that North Korea was involved because it related to the Seth Rogen movie centered around North Korea. And that movie portrayed the essentially the assassination of Kim Jong-un. So some people thought, oh, this is a pure revenge hack. And that's why the hack was also centered around embarrassing Sony and stealing IP and media or movies or whatever. It was a lot of the follow-up activity, whether it was the ransomware, the Bangladesh heist, or later targeting cryptocurrency exchanges and executives that you saw this clear pattern where pure financial incentive was involved. It's interesting that uh, the Department of Justice named a specific person from a couple of different directions, I suppose. First of all, I mean, what is your take on that? The fact that they did that, how do you interpret that? So to me, this is interesting. With a operation that big and the Lazarus Group, there's certainly more than this one person involved. You know, they're probably going to have at least half a dozen, maybe a dozen, who knows, several dozen people. There's going to be a command structure that basically guides them or suggests what they should be targeting. And for them to name one person, maybe somewhat political, that the U.S. wants to say, hey, look, we know you're involved. Here's proof. Here's uh, a showing that we've got certain information. And you can read between the lines that we have a lot more than this. So it may be a way for the U.S. to basically fire a shot across the bow, so to speak, and say, back off, we're on to you, we're watching, we know a lot more than you think. Hmm. Yeah, and what what is your response? I mean, I've certainly heard criticism from folks from a policy point of view who who suggest that what if the shoe were on the other foot? What if the uh, the North Koreans or the Russians or any of our adversaries in cyberspace did the same thing to us and put up a, a photograph of a United States person who was working at, you know, NSA or one of our, our other agencies? How would we respond to that? It'd be interesting. I think the U.S. would respond differently based on the agency. I think it would be a very different response, for example, from the NSA, which would be mostly silence or if they were compelled to release a statement versus what the White House might say versus the FBI. 
Hmm. Nor, of course, is any of our diplomats. You know, this has been a cat and mouse game for many, many years between all of these countries. Basically, any modern country has a capable group of doing this level of intrusion, and we all know it. And each country knows that the rest of them have the capability. So this kind of folds into what many people call the cyber cold war, which is in some ways reminiscent of the original cold war. But in many ways, it's different because of the speed of the information, the style of attack, basically the potential impact behind all of the attacks as well. So I fully expect this to happen to the U.S. at some point and to probably happen to China, Russia, some of the European nations, which a lot of people forget, maintain the same type of group. And some of those European nations are well known for their espionage capabilities. It'll be curious to see if this becomes a tactic, just as kind of a, okay, we caught you on this one, back off a few, we know you're going to continue, but publicly you have to kind of eat some crow and and lay low for a bit. Hmm. Now, take us through what has taken place with Sony since the hack. What's been the long-term fallout? So after the breach, within the first year or two, some of the Sony executives, even a year or two later, still didn't trust digital media and resorted to using fax machines more. Hmm. They were unwilling to put certain information in emails at all. I imagine the amount of phone calls and in-person meetings went up drastically. There were several class action lawsuits filed in 2014 and 2015. At least one of them reached a settlement, probably more. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to dig into all the the lawsuits because there were so many of them. There were at least one or two executives that were pushed out or pressured to resign for various reasons. There was also a doubt from some of the executives, whether the studio would be able to survive at all. And that came out years later when journalists asked and said, hey, you know, in the the past few years, what did you think of the hack? And it's kind of telling that an executive would say, hey, that one breach had the potential to shutter the entire studio. Hmm. And it's interesting because we often see these huge data breaches, most recently Facebook, and we know about Equifax and you know, these insane numbers of records that are taken. And for the most part, no one thinks that any of those companies are going to fold. Typically, what we see is that if they're a public company, their stock takes a hit. And within three months, the stock is back up to where it was. And in some cases, it actually goes up after that. So the notion that this kind of hack could completely destroy a business to that degree for a business this size, is that it's fascinating. And what do you suppose the takeaway lessons have been for the professionals in the cybersecurity industry when they look back on this and and what has happened since? How does it inform their actions? My number one hope is that the companies and the researchers that are operating in this area will be a little slower to jump to attribution because as we saw, there were quite a few companies and researchers that at least based on what we know now, got it completely wrong. Others were correct, but we also don't know the extent of the Lazarus Group right now. Government identified one person, but we don't know a lot beyond that. Or what we do know isn't quite as public or it may be classified. So attribution can be important, but it's also one of the, the things that if you jump to a conclusion, obviously... It doesn't look so good for your skills and your investigation, but it can also cause political fallout. In 2014, as I mentioned earlier, we saw North Korea making public statements to the news. And in one of them, they said, maybe it was us. And then they denied it. So even just leveling accusations like that can increase some of that tension and could have more fallout down the road. So in this case, for example, let's say Someone had said, oh, it's China, which I believe a few people did. And China has to issue a denial. But then what if some of their command structure says, okay, screw those guys. If they're going to blame us, we're going to hit back anyway. Hmm. You know, there's just a lot more that could be at play. The other big takeaway to me is that 
the announcement of the one actor took over two years. And that gives us a good look at the amount of investigation that has to go into this and basically what it takes to be sure that you've got the right person enough to publicly say it like that from the Department of Justice. You know, behind the scenes, that investigation had to have been absolutely incredible. It's interesting to me. I'm curious on your take of this notion that um, that perhaps sometimes companies find it helpful to kind of take cover behind the notion that if they were attacked, well, it must have been a nation state and and surely you can forgive us because who would have the resources to defend themselves against a nation state? Absolutely. And we've been seeing that for years now where as soon as a breach happens and the company identifies that it was an external hack, Basically, the default is to blame APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats, or Nation States. And it's really easy to throw that out there because it might be true, and you don't even need to do attribution beyond that. You don't need to say China, North Korea, or Russia. You just have to say, wow, it was a nation state or it was an APT. There's no way we could have defended against that. In many cases, they're right. These groups, and they they earn their name APT for a reason, they're effective. And if they want to get into an organization, the odds of them doing it are extremely high, bordering on 100%. What are we seeing in terms of follow-up from the companies that are insuring these companies? I can imagine if, if I'm the insurance company covering someone like Sony and a big hack like this happens and and an organization like like Sony or, or another one says, oh, this was uh, some sort of nation state. We couldn't have protected ourselves against them. If I'm the insurance company who has to write a check in response to this, well, I'm certainly going to go in and do my due diligence to try to find out, uh, was it Sony or, you know, was it the, uh, the, the disgruntled uh, janitor with a laptop? Absolutely. And so since the whole cyber insurance thing is relatively new, There's a lot of data points that we just don't know since a lot of these policies aren't public in any fashion or there are rumors. But this story, the whole saga around Sony is interesting because if their insurance company paid out early, and by that I mean even in 2015 or 2016, that's still two years before there was positive attribution. Hmm. So as you said, it makes you wonder what the due diligence looks like. Did the insurance company send in their own investigative team with computer forensics experts to try to determine that? Did they figure out some of that before any of the law enforcement statements? Or perhaps did they kind of come back saying, well, it very much looks like an external, but we don't know the extent. We don't know who. Could have been a kid in the basement. Could have been APT. Could have been nation state. Whatever. I have a feeling that it's going to make some of the insurance companies revisit their policy and perhaps their timetables on when to pay out. Because if we see more and more of these investigations that take ultimately four years, then, yeah, why would an insurance company be so quick to pay out if years later it turns out, nope, it was an insider or nope, it was complete negligence? Right. It's one of the areas that I hope we see more data and more journalism cover it, or the journalists specifically go down that path with the company and their spokespeople and say, okay, you know, let's talk about your insurance. Did you have it? What was the policy like? Did you get paid out? What was the disposition according to the insurance company? And with that kind of data, we could actually start to track more and more of those trends. And that in turn would also be of value to the insurance companies, obviously. Our thanks to Brian Martin from Risk-Based Security for joining us. The research is titled, You Didn't Think the Sony Saga Was Over, Did You? You can find it on the Risk-Based Security website. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative for sponsoring our show. You can learn more about them at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. 
The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.